the worship team do a great job? Let's give it up for the worship team. Can you guys hear me? They make it look easy, don't they? I mean, they just get up here and just sing a song as if they just walked right up. They, mean, they, be pract- they listen to those songs hundreds of times, and the musicians have to start all at one time. I mean, there's just so much energy and effort. Uh, they make it look effortlessly, but uh, they, the reason it makes it, they make it look so easy is because they practice so much. So when you see the people up here playing all the musicians and singers and all of that, they put in hours and hours uh, practices, and uh, they've been uh, spending weeks uh, so that we can be blessed so that we can receive. Um, We can't receive unless someone gives, right? Nothing in life. If someone, for someone to receive, someone has to give. And that's why we we love our good God. Hey, we we have wrapped up the story of Daniel. What a great series as we walk through the story of Daniel. We are actually kicking off a new uh, series. We're gonna, today we're gonna go, we're gonna, we're gonna go back 2,000 years ago. We're gonna go to the city of Rome, now, it's an exciting time to be in the city of Rome. Uh, in Rome, they have gladiators. Have anyone seen the movie Gladiator? They have gladiators there. They have chariots. They have palaces. But we're not going to go to the Colosseum, and we're not going to go to the emperor's palace. Instead, we're going to go to a dark, cold, damp prison cell. And when you peer in, you're going to see an older man that is in his hands and his feet are chained. And he is in some place that you and I would never want to be. Uh, 24 hours a day, he is chained to a guard, probably an evil, very, very toxic individual who is very unhealthy. He can't even suffer in silence, okay? He's got to be chained to another guard next to him who is uh, probably really bad. And it's not like prison today. We think about prison, and we think about prison, we think of three meals a day, you know, our prisons, and there's, there's outside time, and there's weightlifting, and basketball, and there's a library, and there's things to do. Uh, there's TV. Uh, there's nothing like that in this prison cell, In fact, this person, this older gentleman is in prison because he actually says that Jesus rose from the dead and that he conquered sin and that 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 you find true life in Jesus, in a person of Jesus Christ, not in following all the religious rules like all the Pharisees and all the religious people did, but he said that life is found in a person, the person of Jesus Christ, that he died, that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, that a dead man came back to life again and he has a name. And he's greater than the grave. And he's greater than any sin. And he's Jesus. And he's in prison because he would not say that Caesar is Lord. Instead, he said Jesus is Lord. And they wouldn't have any of that. And so they threw him in prison. So now let me ask you a question. What kind of an attitude do you think this person would have? Is he a sourpuss? Is he hopeless? Is he depressed? Is he filled with despair? Is he bitter? What's interesting is that we peer in this prison cell and we see this person that is in prison chained to another guard and he is not complaining, he is not whining. Instead, he's writing a letter. He's writing a letter. Uh, that's over 2,000 years old. And in fact, it would be known as a letter, the irony, a letter of Not despair and hopelessness, but a letter of joy. A letter of joy. And that's what we're going to read about. We're going to read this ancient document written by this guy that's written in a prison cell, chained to someone else. It's the letter of joy. It's the book of Philippians. Book of Philippians. So we're, uh, a couple of years ago, I walked through Philippians chapters one and two, uh, and then we changed message series. It took quite a while to get through chapters one and two. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to look at Philippians chapter three, and then we'll see where we go from there. But Philippians chapter three, if you have your Bible, uh, there are so many rich nuggets to be mined from this ancient document that's over 2,000 years, years old, just to give you context, written by a person that is in prison. And here's what he writes. Philippians chapter three, if you're new to the Bible, or if it's hard to find books, in the front of your Bible, there's a table of contents. Go to the front of your Bible, open, find the table of contents. It'll give you a page number. It's a beautiful thing. You can just flip and find that page number and open it up. Uh, Philippians chapter three, it says this, further, my brothers and sisters, I want you to rejoice in the Lord. I want you to be glad in our God. It is no trouble for me to write the same thing to you again, and it is a safeguard. It is a safeguard for you. And then he says, watch out for those dogs. 
What in the world is that? We'll talk about it. What, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those manipulators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision who serve God by his spirit who boast in what? We boast in Christ Jesus and we put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have, what's that word there? I have, I have more. And then he goes on to describe, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, that is the lineage of kings, a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regards to the law, following God's law, a Pharisee, As for zeal, it doesn't get any higher. It doesn't get any greater. Persecuting the church. As for righteousness, being a good person, following all the religious laws, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. He's the summa cum laude. Faultless. Got it right. Perfect. A plus. 100%. But, verse 7 Whatever was gained to me, I now consider lost for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything lost because there's something better, because of the surpassing worth of knowing a person, knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things, and I consider them garbage. The original language there is skubala. Everybody say skubala. Skubala. Now you can say you know Greek. Consider it scubala, garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him not not having a righteousness on my own, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith. Not through being good, but through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. And then he says, I want to know know this person more and more. I want to know Christ. Yes, the power of his resurrection and the participation in his life sufferings, we don't like that part, let's erase that part. Participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Would you pray with me? God, thank you that your word's living, it's alive, and it's so relevant to all of our lives. So Jesus, have your way with us. Open our eyes, may we have open hearts and open hands to be open to what it is that you want to say to each and every one of us. For we ask this in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, let's, let's go. Verse, chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. He's saying, I want you to be glad in God. It is no trouble for me to write these same things to you again and again. Now, he is in prison. He doesn't know the outcome. Paul doesn't know if he's going to be released from prison, and he doesn't know if he's going to be beheaded. He doesn't know the outcome. And he's saying, I don't want you to, uh, he's, here's what he's saying, I don't want you to get so stuck on your circumstances. I want you to recognize, I want, to, I want you to fix your focus on God. I want you to look beyond your circumstances because if you and I just start to look at our circumstances, we can become depressed and discouraged. But I want you to praise God. I want you to get your focus on God. It is always good to worship God. He is in prison and he's encouraging other people to worship and to rejoice and to be glad in his God because of how good God is and that he is the greatest treasure. And it's interesting is that rejoice is not a feeling word. It's, an actually, it's actually a doing word. In other words, it's something that you do. It's something that you move forward in. And he talks about this idea of rejoicing in God or praising God or worshiping God. It is literally a safe safeguard, safeguard for your heart. Because if you and I are not careful in the struggles of life and the difficulties of life, we can lose our way. We can get sidetracked and think that the struggles of life, this is all there is. And he wants us to lift our eyes because there's someone in something greater than the troubles and the struggles that we are facing. And then verse two, he says, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those manipulators of the flesh. What is he talking about? Is, he, is, it, is it a picture of like, like Lassie, if you remember? Is, this, is that what he's talking about? Like don't have pets. I mean, is, is that what he, what's he talking about? What is he, what is he talking about? Don't have these dogs. What he's talking about is he's talking about the wild dogs that would stray and that would run through the city of Philippi. These dogs were very dangerous 
very, very dangerous. What, so what's he talking about, Eric? This is, you know, that we're 2,000 years removed from the context of what he's talking about. What is he talking about? He's talking about this idea that these Jewish Christians, these Jewish Christians were saying that salvation comes from being circumcised. That was the key to salvation. But Jesus went to the cross, and because he went to the cross, you don't have to try to perform. You don't have to try to be religious. You don't have to try to get it right because Jesus is enough. If all we needed to do to get to heaven was be religious, then why did Jesus have to die on the cross? In fact, I would say, warning, watch out, pay attention to anyone who believes that we are the source of our own salvation. Warning. Every religion in the world places their trust, their hope, their confidence in being good enough, religious enough, doing enough good things. And the logic is good people should go to heaven, right? So I'm gonna try to be better than the person next to me. The problem is you're always gonna find someone better than you and you're always gonna find someone worse than you. Even in prison, that same thing plays out. It doesn't matter where you are, it's never enough. And it says this, it says, for it is we who are the circumcised who serve God by his spirit who boast in Christ Jesus. What's so interesting about this is that Jesus came to the world to introduce something vastly different. He introduced this radical idea that we can have a personal relationship with God personal relationship with God. That's why Paul says, I want to know Christ. I want to know, I want to know him. I want to know Christ. It's not about religion. It's not about rules. It's not about keeping all the law and all of these religious rules. It's not about that. It's about the first century Christians. You have to understand this. The first century Christians, they were captivated by a person, the person of Jesus Christ. And the religious leaders hated him so much that they had Jesus killed because how dare you say that it's not just all about following all the rules and being religious. It's about something else. For it is we who are the circumcision who serve God by the spirit of God and boast in Christ Jesus and we put no confidence in the flesh though I myself have reason for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh or how righteous they are, how religious they are, I have more. Let me ask you a question. What are you placing your confidence in for your salvation? Or let me say it this way. Where are you striving to prove your value? Where are you striving to find your worth, your significance, your identity? I call this the hustle to impress. Can anybody relate? The hustle for validation. Uh, 16 of us guys in, uh, guys in here went on a men's retreat. It was amazing. It was called the heart of a warrior. We were out in the Blue Ridge Parkway. God did some unbelievable things that's just gonna, uh, just gonna so impact um, all of us. I mean, just what God did was, uh, was amazing Thursday through Sunday. And uh, we're gonna do it again. And, and I'm gonna encourage you men to be part of it because God's doing something, some, something significant and something special. And it's powerful. And I'm just so excited to see the men find freedom and step up and find freedom and hope and joy that they can not only for their own hearts, but also for their families and that those that they lead. So while we're at this men's retreat, there's this big guy. He's really boisterous. I mean, all of us Wellspring guys are kind of sitting around. We're kind of hanging out. And then all of a sudden, this big guy walks up and he starts demanding attention. And he starts telling us how important he is. And he says, look at this. He's got Gucci shoes and he's got a decked out shirt. And look at my $5,000 ring, you'd say. Look at my $5,000 ring. And, and man, I'm important and I'm a vice president and I travel all over and I've got a bunch of money. And where's Keola? Keola, where, where are you at, buddy? Hey, I'm going to give you 250 bucks so you can listen to my sermon that I preached before. So he gives Keola $250. And, and then, uh, so he starts going around and, and he's like, so he starts saying things like, well, what time do you wake up? Because I'm up at, what time do you wake up? And what time do you wake up? Because I wake up at four o'clock in the morning. So what's, what's going on? Okay, what's, poor Jeff. Jeff had to drive him home from two and a half hours in the car with this, Give Jeff a high five or a fist bump or whatever you do because the poor guy had to endure a lot. So what's going on, okay? What is, what's, what's going on? What's going on? If we could peel back the layers, what is going on? This guy is, he's hustling to impress. 
Look at how valuable I am. Look at, look at, do you, do you think I'm important? Look at my ring. Is, look, at, look at who I meet with. Look at how much money I have. Look at all these things. Do you think I'm valuable? Am I worth loving? Do you see me? Maybe, maybe if I get more stuff, then maybe you'll notice me. The hustle to impress. The hustle to find validation. That's what the Apostle Paul's doing in here. He's saying, look, if anyone else has confidence, man, if you're trying to go that route of impressing other people or finding validation, I've got more than you. You're all going to pale in comparison. Now, we've all gotten sucked into this game, probably daily. The hustle to impress. I mean, we don't post the first picture we take. No, we look through 257 pictures for just the perfect picture, and then we might even edit it. Because I want you to think I'm important. I want you to think that I'm worth loving. I want you to think that I'm significant, that I'm valuable. You know, we've all positioned the conversation, right, to highlight our strengths, our weaknesses, to diminish our weaknesses and highlight our strengths, right? We all position the conversation or, or we do certain things to say, am I, am I worth loving? Am I worth noticing? I mean, we all want to appear smart, funny, dynamic, successful, accomplished, we're all striving to prove our value, our worth. I mean, no one wants to be the opposite of these things, right? I mean, no one wants to be the opposite of, of you, know, you know, no one else wants to do that. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, we were in a meeting. And one of the staff had a bunch of verses. And they were like, hey, we're going to go around and we're going to have everybody read all these verses. Well, I struggle with reading because I have dyslexia. So I'm like, oh, going to be humiliated. But some of you looking through your lens, it's like, wow, you love drama and, and dramatics. You love to read. That's an opportunity for you to shine. But some of us struggle with reading. In every group environment, when someone's going to say, Eric, how about you read those seven chapters out loud? It'll take you the next 45 minutes. I'm like, I'm We all want to show that we're important, we're, we're valuable, that we're worth loving. We want to diminish the things in our lives that are, that, are, um, that are detracting from us. And that's not a wrong thing, but what the Apostle Paul is talking about, he's contrasting two ways of living life. In this way of living life, the Apostle Paul was saying that, you know what, I used to think that life was all about proving how righteous I was and being a good boy and getting it right and, and just being perfect. And if I did it good enough and I did it well enough, then maybe you'll accept me and maybe God God will accept me as well. Two ways. See, here's the problem. We all have a God-shaped vacuum in our life, a God-shaped hole in our life that God is the only one that can fill that. The problem is when, but sin breaks that, that sin breaks that relationship. It breaks that relationship between my, from between God and me. And so now I run around and I'm striving to find my validation and my worth. If I am not getting my validation and worth from God, I promise you I'm getting it from somewhere else because every one of us have a need for love and validation. And sin breaks this connection from the source of God. Namely, he's the main one. So we're hungry and we're desperate for being noticed. Do you notice me? Do you value me? Do you think I'm significant? Significant? Am I worth loving? So instead of turning to God for our love and validation, we go searching for it. We go looking for it in all these different places and all these different outlets and all these different opportunities for someone to say that I have value and I have significance and I have worth, that I'm worth loving um, we become like black holes. <clears throat> black holes. Black holes are fascinating, aren't they? Fascinating. Um, black holes, um, the gravitational pull in black holes is so strong that it sucks everything in. Even light will be sucked in to these black holes. I mean, nothing can resist it, especially the really, really strong ones. And nothing escapes it. it. Black holes are like big vacuum. <laughs> You know, I mean, they're like giant vacuums. They just suck everything that comes in, in contact with it. 
In fact, the largest black hole that we know of, because we can only see so far, the largest black hole that we know of, get this, it's 40 billion times the size of our sun. 40 billion times. Okay, I just, I mean, it's just like, okay, it's, Perspective, how big is that? Well, how many Earths could you fit in our sun? If it's 40 times bigger than our sun, how big is, how big? You could put 1.3 million Earths inside our sun. Our God created that. We stand in awe and wonder at the black hole and you have no idea how big and how glorious and how great. Do you have any, under, any, any reason or, or understanding why Paul would say, God is better? Are you kidding me? He's the greatest thing in the world. And Paul says, I forget all that stuff that I would know this God, that this God would love me and choose me and long to have a relationship with me. This infinite God that is bigger. You and I can't even be in his presence in our human form because we can't handle his greatness. I'd be on my face if God like, whoop, pulled back his glory like, whoop. Man, I'd be on my, whoa, man, I can't wait to see him. Because he's just that good. He's just that wonderful. He's, that, he's worth giving everything up to follow God, to follow Jesus Christ. And I'm going to call you to that because he is the center of all things. All things exist for him and from him and to him. He is the maker of all things. This little black hole, it's like he'd like flick it with his finger. I mean, it's like nothing. It's like puny. He's the sovereign God of the universe. And we have an opportunity to have a relationship with him. That's how good our God is. That's how great our God is. Are you living for the applause of men and petty accomplishments and small things? See, black holes have this insatiable appetite that suck everything in. And if we are not spending time with God and allowing God to fill us up, we will become like black holes. We will become running around trying to suck, suck everyone and everything dry. And when things don't go our way, we're devastated. Because our hope rests in something that is not secure. In fact, we can even take good, pure things and manipulate them to try to suck something out of something so pure. In fact, Jesus talks about this. Jesus talks about this in Matthew 6. Jesus says, be careful, be careful. Not to practice your righteousness or being good, you practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. And when you pray, pray, something innocent is prayer. And when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. Why? For they love to pray standing, taking something as pure as prayer. Don't, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and the street corners to be seen by others. They pray these long, lofty, real big worded prayers of saying, do you think I'm important? Look at how important I am. Did you like my prayer? Was it good enough? This is the hustle to impress. So Paul looks at his former way of living, that he was a Jew and zealous, and he tried to do all these things, trying to impress all these people. He used to think that he could find and impress God by doing all of these other things, by being righteous and religious and following all the rules, and he could do all these things, and then God would say, bravo, bravo, you, you've, earned, you've earned my love. You've worked for it hard enough. Let me ask you a question. What are you looking to for love and validation? What are you looking to? Warning, being consumed with people and other things. This is, this is living life on empty. You ever drive your car and it's on empty? It's close to, close to. This is living life on empty. To the extent that we are living life on empty. In other words, what I mean is, instead of finding my love validation from God, and I strive to find it from other things in this life, then I will be miserable To the degree that I am not getting love and validation from God, I'm going to strive to get my love and validation from accomplishments, from work, from family, from good looks, from being strong enough, smart enough, having enough money, being fit enough, playing a video game. And if I don't win, throw the thing on the floor. Oh, I didn't win the video game. What what was that about? What was that about? It's a video game. It's not even real life. 
I'm trying to find my identity in this video game to tell me that I'm, I have what it takes. I have what it takes. Playing sports. If your identity is wrapped up in your looks, what happens when you get old? And we are all getting old. And you don't have hair anymore. We're all moving in that direction. Well, my point is this. What are you trying to find that will say that you're, love, that you're worth loving and you're good enough and you're valuable enough and you're important? And Paul talks about this idea that whatever was gained to me, I consider loss because I want to know God because he is not, he, my hope and my identity is not, when we place our identity in the things of this world, it is fragile and it is temporary. Did I play, did I play well enough? If you don't play well, oh man, why, what's, what's all this man? What is it? My identity is tied right there. Pick your, pick your issue. Okay, I, I haven't arrived. I'm there with you. We're all jacked up. Because we all have lies in our life that says we're not worthy of love and validation and we have to earn it and we have to prove it. That's the way of the world. God flips the tables and says it's not about what you do or what you've done. That's not who you are. It's radical. Who you say, and we can sing those songs. Those are nice and cute little songs. But do you believe it? God could never forgive me after what I've done. Eric, you don't know what I've done. I don't. But God does. And he loves you despite what you've done. Despite what you did last night. Despite what you did last year. It's called amazing grace. We're talking about the infinite God of the universe that is far bigger than any sin that you've done. He could squash your sin like this. It is nothing. He's saying, would you just come home? Would you just come home? Would you just, you don't have to perform for me. You don't have to get it right. I know you don't get it right. I know what you've done. You don't have to pretend you can be honest because I love you. There's a better way instead of striving. And what we need to do is daily go to Jesus and say, Jesus, would you tell me who I am? Jesus, would you fill me up today? Would you fill me up with love and validation so that I'm not so desperate and needy and become a black hole of trying to suck everyone and everything dry and when things don't go right and they won't, that I'm not just a mess? Finding love and... When we can find our love and validation from God, we... And there's a verse that's very interesting, verse 10. He says, I want to know Christ. Yes, the power of his resurrection. And participate in the sufferings. Participate in Jesus' sufferings? Okay, listen to me. When you are allowing God to fill you up, you lose your fear. Because a free person who has died to the things of this world or their identity doesn't rest so much, they can play a video game and not win and it doesn't hurt so much because they're not looking to a video game to validate their identity or accomplishment or an award or making more money. I mean, how much is enough? Just a little bit, a little bit more. Never enough. If I made a little bit more, then I'd be happy. If I get the new car, I'd be happy. We get the new car, and a year later, the next model comes out. Temporary. Yes, we will find. Don't cling to the things of the world because you're free. In other words, we don't need these things. Our identity, our hope isn't rest in these things. When I am allowing God to fill me up, and my identity is found in him, and in order to get there, we have to identify our lies. Man, there's so much in this. We have to identify our lies. (laughs) Okay. Some of our lies is, I'm evil. God hates me. I'm unlovable. I've sinned. I've committed this sin 10,000 times, and I've asked God to forgive me 10,000 times. How could I continue to ask God to forgive me? He won't forgive me. I'm beyond his grace I'm evil. I'm a bad person. I'm a failure. I'm a loser. And so you know what? Someone told you, maybe a dad said, you're a loser, you're no good piece of trash. Okay, maybe not exactly those words, but kind of this idea. So you know what you're going to do? 
buddy, I'm gonna prove dad wrong and I'm gonna make enough money and I'm gonna continue to climb the corporate ladder because I'm gonna prove to myself and my dad he was wrong. What are we dealing with? We're dealing with a lie, a lie. And anything that threatens, triggers this, I call it getting triggered, anytime, anytime there's an excessive emotion, okay, oh, you really wanna be free? then you have to do the hard work. Here's, well, Eric, what's the hard work? Stop making excuses for your junk. Stop blaming everyone and everything else. Take personal ownership. Why did you get so mad? Well, they did and they did it. Yeah, I know, that's what, blame, blame, blame. Okay, why, you should have had this much emotion, but instead you had this much emotion. Any excessive emotion, I would argue, and I'd put a million bucks that there's a lie down there that just got punched. Problem is we stuff our junk because we, we got to function, right? Ooh, someone triggers us. Oh, there it comes. Oh, it's about ready to break out. It's about ready to break out. Okay, when are you ever going to, and you, we got to function, right? We got to go to a job and we got to live life. When are you ever going to go back and say, what was that about? What was that really about? Well, I know what we're going to say. Well, they shouldn't and them, and we're going to do all this. As long as you do that, you will continue to live in bondage. It will not go away. You can bury it, but it's going to resurrect every time that thing gets triggered because you haven't pulled the root out. You need to stop and say, Jesus, what is that? Because there's a lie there. And Jesus, we, I have hundreds of lies. I don't even know what they all are. And so do you. It's the matrix. You take the red pill and the blue pill. And you're like, whoa, dude, I'm really jacked up. I didn't even know I had this much junk in me. Yep, welcome to the club. That's why we need Jesus. There is so much more freedom to be had. There is so much more freedom from your junk. So many strongholds that God wants to set you free. He wants to change you. He wants you to be a different person one year from now than you are today. But it will take you stop making excuses and blaming other things and other people for you to take personal ownership to say, what was that really about? So today, when, when you get triggered, not if, when, if not today, tomorrow for sure, you ask the question, what was that really about? Jesus, would you begin to heal me and f help me to find freedom? And I'm so out of time. Would you just bow your heads with me for a second? Oh, I want you to know God loves you. God loves you and he has a good plan for your life. And you don't have to be dependent on all these external things. You don't have to perform for God. You don't have to get, he just wants you to be real with him. He wants you to be real with him. What are you looking to for love? What are you looking to for validation? What are you looking to for your significance and your identity? Would you pray that prayer this next week? God, what am I looking to for my worth? I've got to have the perfect family. I have to have the perfect kids. Well, good luck with that. Whatever you're, we all have it. I want you to know that God loves you and he wants to forgive you, and he wants to set you free, and he wants to strip away the things of the world, and he wants you to have true worth and value and identity. And he doesn't want you just to appear good and pretend and have this image and facade that you're really good. He wants to change you on the inside. He wants to change you on the inside. He wants to forgive you. He wants to give you a new heart. He loves you. He cares for you. Oh God. God, some of us in here are gonna say enough. I'm tired of, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm sick and tired of this lie that's so perpetual and stupid, this stupid little lie that every time it, I get punched, I, get, I just blow up and I get I, emotions. I'm tired of it. Jesus, Jesus, open our eyes to our junk. Open our eyes to our junk. And may we invite you because you are the great healer you want to heal us and you want to give us an identity and a validation and a security that is far greater than any little award that we win or some little plaque or a trophy or a applause or a win on Fortnite that is so short-lived. God, you want to do a deeper work of grace in our hearts, so would you do that? God, may we not be the same one year from now because 
we've allowed you to begin to change us and we all need changing. We all need healing. We all need freedom. And that's what he wants for you. And that's where we're going. So church, let's roll. Let's get it. Hey, life's way too short to waste your life. Life's way too, way too short to live a day living with some silly little petty lie that you picked up because your dad told you something, your mom told you something, your dad didn't give you something, your mom didn't give you something. And now you're believing things about you and it's holding you back. But Eric, it's terrifying. Yeah, I know, I get it, it's terrifying. But you don't have to live that way. You don't have to live another second, but it will take you and I to invite Jesus into those broken places that we all have. Jesus, we need you. You are the great healer. You are the great physician. And Jesus, we wanna live more and more for you because you are eternal. You're the sovereign God of the universe. You're the most important one in all things. And may, when we live for you, we, we can, you, can, you fill us up and we can actually be a blessing to others. We no longer are manipulating. We're not no longer needing people to get our identity. We're not using people. We're not black holes. We can actually give and bless and serve and encourage because you have filled us up. So Jesus, fill us up expose our junk, and heal us. That's what we're asking, that we would not be the same. In the power and the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing the song in response to God's great love. The depth of God's love for us. May we love him in response. We love because Your love is perfect And your heart is kind And I'm yours forever And forever you're mine And Jesus, the anchor of my heart Jesus, the anchor
right, you guys can have a seat, but before I let you guys out online, don't log off. We got graduation coming up. Uh, Eric's got some big news for us, so don't log off. I know as soon as I come on, it's time to log off. So that's a lie, I believe, guys. So if you could stay logged in, if you're online, that would be great. Um, if this is your first time, hey, welcome. Uh, for some of you, man, I haven't seen you guys in a while. I love seeing you guys here. You bring such joy to my life, so welcome back. And um, if you have not filled out a Connect card, so you've been coming a little while, maybe today is your first time. If you have not filled out a Connect card, please go ahead and fill it out because we got a lot of cool information that we don't want you to miss. A lot of cool things happening. So if you could, please fill that out. Next week is baptisms. So if you if this is your next step, if baptism is, is your next step to take, we want to connect with you. So I'll be up there. If you got questions about baptism, I'd love to connect with you guys, uh, get you signed up. I know we right now we have about eight people ready to ready to. Um, give their life uh, through baptism. So let's give them a hand already. Yeah. Praise God. Praise God. A lot of cool things happening um, here in this place. And uh, for those of you that have brought your tithes and offerings online, you continue to bring it to our website. For those of you here, you can drop it off into the box up there. But I'd love to bring Eric up real quick because he's got some great things for us. Don't log off because we do have um, graduation too. Love this guy right here. Love you, man. I'm good. I got my mic. Thanks. Um, so we, as you can tell, this, this space has, uh, it's been fantastic. And one of the things we've been doing, we've been praying for another location because we just, we can't go to the next level at this space. Parking, as you know, is uh, cram packed over there. The kids space, a third of our church, over a third of our church is kids. And we have just, uh, we've outgrown that space. Uh, Abby that leads our kids saying we can't get to the next level. And if kids don't have a great experience, uh, parents don't come back. It's the number one reason parents choose uh, a church is they want to have a great uh, experience and also a teen experience uh, that Bruce does a fantastic job for that as well. So what we've done is we've been praying. Um, David Price uh, a couple of weeks ago woke up at three o'clock in the morning. We've been praying for years, and he said, "I'm going to contact Life Point Church." Uh, Life Point Church had been meeting at Wake Forest High School, uh, and they decided to no longer meet there. Uh, and what's amazing is they've just invested $50,000 hooking up an amazing sound system, a soundboard, hooked it all up. It's got a beautiful auditorium that uh, just can expand and grow tons of classrooms and tons of, of space. And they also allow you to store a lot of the stuff um, on site, which is a huge thing for us because we have to tear down. And everything you see, we have to tear down and set up. So it's a massive uh, undertaking for the church. And so um, we, are, we are pretty close. We're in the high 90% that that is going to be a possibility. Now, there are other churches that we're asking for that space because it's a great space. Uh, it's further north uh, in Youngsville. So we wanted to stay on the further north side of things. But most importantly, we want more people to find freedom. I want more people to know our good God. I want more people to know that they're loved by the infinite God of the universe. I want more people to find more and more freedom. I want more freedom. I want more freedom for people in our city. I want more marriages restored and lives healed and more wholeness and restoration because there's a better way to live. And so we want, and we can't, we're, we're limited. We're capped at where we are. And so this door has opened up. Uh, we're looking at the possibility of moving uh, sometime in August, the middle of August. We will let you know, uh, and we will meet at Wake Forest High School. We will not be at Heritage High School. School. We will be at Wake Forest High School, and there's many reasons, all kinds of stuff. Also, they have all kinds of sound boards, and I'll give you more of the details later. It's just, I just want you to know that it's coming, but here's what I also want you to know. I want you to know that we need your help. I mean, it's going to take all of us leveraging your strengths, your gifts, your abilities of us partnering together, and let's reach our city, because there's people that desperately need it, and I'm going to ask you to get in the game. I'm going to ask you to get off the sidelines and let's roll, because we need you. God needs you. But God doesn't need you. He's going to use someone else. But you have an opportunity to serve our good God and to help more and more people. So I'm going to ask you, and we're going to, we're going to ask you, there's different, a variety of different areas where you can plug in, and we're going to partner together, and we're going to make a difference by the power of God and what he's doing, because more and more people need to know him and need to find freedom. So we'll, I wanted you to be on the end. We, this just happened recently. Um, it's not 100% sure, but it's pretty close uh, that this is gonna happen. So I wanted you guys to be in the know immediately that it's coming, and we're gonna ask you to, to help, and let's partner together, leverage your gifts, abilities, and let's, let's go get it. Let's reach our city. And with that, I think I'm gonna call Bruce up at this time for graduations. Let's give it up for Bruce. Hello? That's all I had. 
but no, just kidding. Uh, it is a great honor and privilege for us to kick off our graduation celebration, um, to celebrate three amazing graduates, two high school and one college. And uh, I think we can all attest that this year has been kind of crazy and kind of difficult. And so for them to not only fight through that, but to go ahead and graduate is an amazing thing that we should be celebrating and honoring them. And so with that, I'm going to call our first graduate, Joshua Dino. Joshua is graduating from Heritage High School. He's been involved uh, with an all-conference NAC six honorable mention for football sports, uh, football spring sports season of 2021, varsity football team of August 2018 to April 2021, junior varsity football team August 2017 to October 2018, junior varsity lacrosse March 2018 to May 2019, National Honor Society member from October 2020 to June 2021, Letterman's Club, August 2018 to June 2021, the Vice President and Recruiting Coordinator, been very involved in a lot of different stuff. He's uh, going to be attending and playing football at Shenandoah University in the fall of 2021. So that is Joshua Denno. <laughs> Secondly, we've got Trent Nickel. There we go. Yeah. Trent has uh, had a unique high school experience due to, in part, moving to North Carolina after 10th grade and then COVID hitting. He's attended five different high schools, and Trent will readily admit that academics are not his favorite activity. Therefore, his actual GPA does remain a mystery. This makes the fact that he's graduated in three and a half years instead of four even more significant for him. Trent tried high school athletics, but found it wasn't for him. Amen to that. Instead, he began his first job at the age of 14, working consistently all throughout high school. As Trent finished a semester early, he began a course at Wake Tech and is enrolled to continue there this fall full-time, where he's going to pursue a full or a career in HVAC. So there is Trent. <laughs> All right, our next graduate is Colton Reed. Here we go. Yeah. Colton is graduated magna cum laude with a BS in finance with a minor in accounting from Liberty University. Let's go, Liberty. Yeah. Where he played a Liberty University men's basketball team. He has the Tau Sigma for Honor Society the SAAC representative for NCAA Division I men's basketball, NCAA A Sun Conference, all academic team, awarded a full scholarship for graduate school. His future plans are to attend Liberty University for two years as a graduate assistant in the athletic department while completing his MBA. So there is our graduates this year as well, Spring. Let's celebrate them one more time. All right, Trent, I'm going to ask for you to come right here. And then, Colton, I'm going to ask for you to stand kind of over there in front of this amazing light pole that's right there. All right. Uh, families, if you don't mind, uh, to find your graduate and celebrate or to surround them, we're going to pray for them really quick. So, families, uh, you can come up and surround your graduate, and we'll pray with them. All right, church, as this, sorry, Audrey, <laughs> as these, oh, okay. <laughs> All right, as these three men start a new chapter in their life, let's, as a church, uh, commit to continue to pray for them and, and lift them up. And so each of them are on different paths, but exciting paths. And so uh, let's pray. Uh, Jesus, you are so good to us, Lord. You love us, um, and you love each of these three men. They faced a lot this past year. And uh, Lord, as they start a new chapter, be with them, walk with them each step of the way, give them wisdom and guidance on uh, just their course through college and what to do next. And uh, Jesus, help them to lean into you, um, help them to find good, great, amazing friends uh, that are going to surround them, they're going to push them to be better. 
And uh, Lord, we ask that you work amazing miracles into the life and that they draw close to you. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. All right, I'll let them go down and find their seats really quick. You thought you were done with me, but you're not. Okay, so we've got uh, one big thing as a church that I would love for each of you to do, if you have the time, is there's cards over there on the blue table, uh, right near Keola. There he is. Look at that. Yeah. All right. So each of those baskets have cards, and so we would love for you to write maybe an encouraging letter or share a verse or even write out a prayer just for them to be able to take home and read um, and to sort up in their hearts as they go off to college. Um, the second thing is we got freeze pops because it's youth. So we're going to celebrate them with freeze pops after service wherever Ethan, Ethan's in the back. He's got a bag full of freeze pops. So your kids can go ahead and get like five or six, as many as they want. Um, so after service, uh, right after the song by the worship band, uh, we'll do freeze pops. So.